Today on Groundworks, I physically assemble a home theater PC with components recommended by MyMediaExperience.com. Stay tuned! A lot of people that have home theaters have one without a home theater PC and that works just fine. Uh, you get a Blu-ray player, maybe even go up to like an, one of those Oppo Blu-ray players and just put in the disc and you get perfect quality uh, discs or films every time. Uh, that's not me though. I'm more about convenience. I don't want to have to go and change a disc every time. I want to have all my movies, all accessible, all the time. Technically speaking, I don't actually need a home theater PC if that's all I want to do is have all of my videos available at all times. In fact, an easier solution is to just get a Roku box that's attached to the, uh, the theater and then have Plex running both on a computer with all your movie files and then have the Plex client running on the Roku. Um, that's actually what I'm doing right now and it works pretty good. Really, in my case though, what I want is something that is more of a direct connection. A, a Roku box is inherently a streaming box. And yeah, even, even with a gigabit network that I have here, every now and then the thing will just kind of hang a bit. Plex 2, for as slick as it is, is, is very limited. It's not very customizable. And if you want to do anything really special with it, it, it ain't gonna happen, not with Plex. That you do things the Plex way, if you're fine with that, you're good. If you wanna do things different, you need something else. So in my case, I do actually need a home theater PC. It's something that I can go and attach directly to my receiver, so I'll always have direct access to my movies, no streaming, no transcoding, nothing like that. And then I can also run whatever software I want. Um, I'm probably gonna run Kodi at first just to try it. Um, if that works, great. If it doesn't, maybe I'll move on to something else. But in the end, I will actually have control of exactly what happens. This particular video is gonna show how to do the creation of the home theater PC itself from component to a running computer. Software and configuration will come later. Let's get started. The Intel Haswell i3-4160 is plenty fast enough, relatively inexpensive, and energy efficient. Skylake gives us nothing that matters, and the 4160T is more energy efficient, but not by much, and is notably more expensive. The motherboard is the Gigabyte H97M DS3. It has Gigabyte reliability that's cheaper than an ASUS and has support for everything that matters. Four gigabytes of RAM is surely enough, but the price differential to eight gigabytes isn't very much, and so eight gigabytes it is. The stock Intel CPU cooler is probably good enough, but for extra insurance, I got the side cooler, and it's probably a good thing I did. SSD is a must for fast access to files, and Samsung Evo series is top notch. 250 gigabyte because, well, it's a sweet spot for its space plus price. Ripped Blu-rays take a ton of space, so six terabyte spinning drive is a bare minimum. I believe this is the last of the Western Digital Green series, and the replacement's the Blue series. Red series is complete overkill for this purpose. The Silverstone GD06 is highly recommended as an HTPC chassis, but as you'll see, I ended up not being very much of a fan. And Seasonic makes great power supplies, enough said. I configured the motherboard out of the case since the CPU cooler needs access to the bottom. Start by removing the plastic CPU shield by un unclipping it and then moving the lever back. The retail i3 comes with a cooler, but mine arrived broken. Good thing I wasn't planning on using it at all. The CPU fits in the socket only one way. There are two notches on the CPU that match up with two tabs in the socket. Closing the CPU shield is easy, but it is possible to do it wrong. If you simply fold it over, then the shield strikes the top of the screw that's in the way and it won't fit properly. Notice that the hinge mechanism can go forward or back. If you move the lever all the way backwards, then it pulls the shield back as well. Then, when you fold it over, it falls in front of the screw. Use the lever then to cinch it all into place under the screw. This does not take a lot of effort, so if it does resist, you're probably doing it wrong. The first step in installing the heatsink is the assembly of the clips. We need the Intel clip. The orientation does matter. The offset part needs to be facing down. The screw hardware is a number 9 screw or bolt and a number 10 nut. Or the other way around, I don't remember. Fit the bolt into the middle hole of the clip. Then screw on the nut and hand tighten. When done, repeat for the other three. The next step is attaching the assembly clips to the heatsink. Rest the clip on the heatsink with the previously installed nuts facing down. 
Attach the clip to the heatsink with the tiny number five screws using a Phillips number two screwdriver. It takes two screws per clip. Do them all this way. Now we need to install the back plate. As the name implies, it needs to be done in the back of the motherboard. This is why we're assembling this now instead of after the motherboard is installed in the case. Note the four holes. Those match up with the middle of the four holes in the back plate. The rubber side faces the motherboard. The back plate has some indentations that fit existing screws which help for alignment. The screws attached to the back plate are the somewhat longer number six screws. Drop the screws through the four holes. They are held in place using the rubber washers. Just press the rubber washers over the screws on the front part. The heatsink comes with its own thermal grease that needs to be applied to the CPU's heat shield. It needs to be a thin layer, but fairly even and thoroughly covering the heat shield. It's easier if you have a spreader tool for this, but since I don't have one anymore, the edge of the plastic tube works just fine. And now the moment we've been building up to, actually installing the heatsink. Finally. The proper orientation of the heatsink is for the fins to face the sides of the motherboard and the pipes to face the RAM and the back of the motherboard. The four combination screws and nuts that you installed in the assembly clips fit on top of the four screws that are being held in place with the rubber washers. To attach the heatsink, you need to flip over the motherboard and screw the longer number six screws into the combination nuts on the assembly clips. I use a number two Phillips head screwdriver. Just snug the screws down tight. This motherboard has four RAM slots, each accepting an 8GB module, leaving us with a max of 32GB. That's extremely overkill for an HTPC when even 4GB is typically more than enough. I'm going to use 8GB since the price is nearly the same and so why not? There is a notch in the module that leaves one side of the pins longer than the other. This orients the module so it can only install in one direction. In this case, it means that the label is facing outwards. Start by opening up the first RAM slot by flipping back the tabs. Then, place the module into the slot and firmly push down. When it's pushed down enough, you'll hear a click, and the two tabs will lever up to lock the module into place. And that's all it takes. One disadvantage of this Silverstone case right off the bat is that you need tools to take it apart unlike most decent cases these days. Most of those can be done using thumb screws and the like. Not this one. Start by removing the three back screws to get the top off. Then pull the top back and up. There are notches on the side that you need to line up, so pull it back until those notches do line up, and then you can pull it up. Next up is removing the supports for the optical drive. We have no need for it since this particular HTPC won't have any drive. All movies are ripped MKV files. Start by removing the two tiny screws on the side. A magnetized tip definitely helps. Then remove the two remaining screws on the back and the top. These are all really tiny screws, so I'm finding that using a power drive just really wants to strip them. A handheld screwdriver is much safer and not much slower. The next part of disassembly is removing the hard drive bracket. It has four screws on the top. The back two screws just need a standard number two driver. The front two screws are significantly smaller. Those required pulling out my precision screwdriver set and using a rather small S2 bit. What a pain. Once the screws are gone, there's nothing physically securing the hard drive bracket in place, but it still takes a little doing to get it out. That's because this is a hot swap drive and there's a spring loaded door in the front of the case that wants to get in the way. I do not understand at all why you'd want hot swappable drives in an HTPC. That's more of a NAS server thing than an HTPC. Odd. The case actually comes with little rubber feet that can be attached to the bottom of the power supply to help dampen the vibrations. We can tell which side is the bottom on the power supply by looking for the fan. That's going to blow through the vent at the bottom of the case. The feet have sticky backs, so just stick them to the four places on the bottom. The case comes with a bunch of common case screws. I have no idea what size these are, but every case and every motherboard I've ever seen comes with these, so they're some sort of standard. We use four of them to attach the power supply to the back of the case. Same old Phillips number two screwdriver. 
Before installing the motherboard, we must first install the I.O. shield. That comes with the motherboard. It just snaps up in a place in the appropriate spot on the back of the case. It's finally time to install the motherboard. This particular case supports mini ATX and micro ATX motherboards. Our motherboard is a micro ATX, which is slightly bigger. It uses these standoffs. Just line up the holes to the standoffs and use the ubiquitous case screws to screw it all into place. It's worth noting that on the I.O. shield there are tabs that are associated with all of the cutouts. You aren't supposed to snap them off. They are there to provide some tension between the shield and the motherboard, so just leave them in place. Now, there are no more in-process videos after this because all of the shots that I took ended up being just my big fat hands blocking the shot or they were out of focus. So I'll try to just describe things with the pictures and we'll see how that goes. The hot swap drive bracket needs to be removed else it takes up far too much space and makes it nigh impossible to fit the power supply. This has just four number two screws. With the bracket gone, we can install the two hard drives to the underside of the hard drive support beam screwing through the top. Each fits in only one place. The big rotational drive gets the screws with the rubber brackets while the SSD is screwed directly into place. Slip the hard drive support beam right side up and reattach it to the case. The support beam that used to be part of the optical drive bracket is also put back just to give it the case some rigidity. But uh, don't do that until after everything else is plugged in though. One nice thing about this case is that it comes with a bunch of adjustable hold down straps that can be used to bundle up the wires and leave them at least a little bit tidy. Some of the connections are still quite a pain, like the ones that are behind the CPU heatsink. You might find it easier to remove the heatsink while plugging everything into that side. Most of the control plugs are on the open side and it's pretty straightforward to match up the labels on the cables with the pins. Do be careful about negative and positive though. Not all the pins are oriented in the same way. The hard drives are plugged in using the supplied cables. The SSD drive definitely needed the 90 degree head in order to fit properly. This is the right side of the front with the front face down. That's two USB 3 ports plus headphone and microphone and a reboot button plus the optical space if I ever wanted one. The left side isn't quite so pretty now that the hot swap hard drive bracket is gone. I'm not sure if I'll make a replacement or not since it's mostly hidden when the front face is up. And this is why the case is recommended. It fits perfectly into existing AV equipment. It's very clean, very professional looking. When all is said and done, I can't really recommend this case. Yeah, it's definitely a nice looking case and it fits really well inside of an AV rack. But it has too many design constraints and honestly, it's just a little too limiting in the end screws in 2016 and notice how some of them were really odd sized screws too hot swap bays in an htpc why and that just takes that's another thing that just takes up too much room when it's installed it's very difficult to fit a power supply in there so you want to probably remove it just because well you don't need the hot swap part of that and you want to fit in a power supply but as soon as you do now you don't have as many places to even put a drive because it doesn't really have any other places to put them other than the two spots, you know, for the SSD and the magnetic hard drive. Honestly, in the end, any reasonable desktop case is gonna probably perform better than this if you don't care about the looks. If you do care about appearances, and that makes sense that you might, considering it is gonna be among other AV components, then I have to imagine that there are better HTPC cases out there. And if there's not, why not? That can't be that hard. So at this stage, we have a working computer, but it's not actually running anything. Next up is installing OpenELEC on the computer to make it a fully functional HTPC. When it's actually done, it should appear right here. Thanks for watching.